Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Blackboard. Uh, thank you all so much for coming, as always. Um, just wanted to let you know, in case you didn't know, we're, it's kind of a special night. We're going to do a uh, video recording of this performance that will end up being on YouTube and uh, maybe passed around some other places. So uh, having said that, if you need to get up, you know, you need to get up. But if you don't need to get up, maybe don't get up. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> You need to get up, go, but um, just trying to uh, just try to be mindful of of that with cell phones and, and stuff like that. But also have a great time. Uh, feel free to clap and hoot and holler in between songs and stuff like that. But just want to make sure you knew we were uh, doing a video recording. But anyway, I'm going to get out of the way because y'all came to hear Richard, right? So uh, without further ado, our friend Richard Hefner. <laughs> cough drop out. I got to do, whoop, that's not a cough drop. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of reminds me of uh, when me and Maddie went over one time to Lime Kiln to see uh, Leon Redbone. I had no idea who Leon Redbone was. I thought he was a black guy. <laughs> and he came out on the stage, walked out on the rocks up there, and he sat down and looked at the crowd and we hold that for me. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody got a cough drop? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he sat there and looked at the crowd a little bit. It was just him and a tuba player. <laughs> and, uh, hmm, thank you. I'm not nervous. <laughs> I've been to a couple of weenie roasts. <laughs> he, uh, he bent down and got him a drink, had him a drink, and I said, what is, what's this guy doing? And then he, he picked up a camera and took a picture of the audience. And I I kind of like this guy.
I know you can. <laughs> Sounds great in here, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. This is anybody's first time being here? Bet you a lot of you first time. It won't be your last, I bet. There's got some good stuff going on. Nick, I, I appreciate you guys for doing this and inviting us down here this evening to do this. And I hope we do something you like. This one here will be a... Uh, oh, I know what it is. This is an old time tune. I like to do. Uh, I think this this thing was written maybe in uh, in the twenties. Anyway, it's one called "World's Waiting for the Sunrise." <laughs> here with my fan base here um, I've known Joanna since she was born and uh, she moved in across the road there when she was a little baby I guess is what she'd say or uh, is Gibbs here didn't, he make, didn't it. make it anyway you might know Gibbs Kinderman this is Gibbs daughter and uh, back right back there I see Josh now the husband <laughs> hold up your hand there Josh Hardy 
Here's the husband right there. And uh, just your condolences out there. <laughs> <laughs> but she's been one of my best friends and has become a, a really one of my very, very best friends here in the last couple of years since she started playing the bass in, in the band and we do this stuff sitting around at the house once in a while, but this is only the second time we've ever played out in public, just the two of us. I want you to give Joanna Burt Kinderman a hand there on the back. Good job. Good job. I'm going to try to remember this story, too, that uh, Bob was telling me about this, and I'd, I'd totally forgotten about it, but uh, in the house that they live in now, which is right across the road from where I was raised up, was uh, Miss Belle Vesta Aldridge lived there. She was from Roanoke, Virginia, and her uh, husband ran the general store there at Mill Point that my, my dad went to work for him and then ended up running the store, but uh, Rube Aldridge was his name. Rube died in the early 50s. But Bill Vesta lived in a house, and and um, I'd go over there and do work for her, and uh, she she paid pretty good. I'm, I don't know what it was anyway, but uh, me and Harley Carpenter, who uh, I'll get into Harley Carpenter, who was one of my biggest influences and helped start this band out together back in the 60s. Uh, Harley came down, and her driveway went in a different place it does now, and it, it was drifted full of snow about four foot deep. Me and Harley went down there to shovel the driveway out. And well, she had them good maple sugar cakes, and we I knew I told Harley, I said, "Man, she's gonna pass, and we'll get a sugar cake too." <laughs> and we shoveled. It took us over half a day, and we got the thing shoveled out, and went in there and sat down at the table, and she talked small talk a little bit, you know, and give us a sugar cake, and, and she's going there digging around in her purse to get us a fifty seventy five cents. And Harley was seen these peanuts sitting there on the table. So he got to dipping in them peanuts and eating them, and he ate them peanuts, and she paid us, and uh, Harley said, Miss Belvest, I'm sorry, but I've eaten all your peanuts out of this bowl here, and she said, that's all right, Harley, I can't eat them anymore. Since I lost my teeth, all I can do is suck the chocolate off of them. <laughs> so that's a true story, Bob. I got that before Reader's Digest got it, too. <laughs> We went to, our band went to uh, Ireland in 2000 and played. Well, actually just a couple members, but we went with the Bang Brothers, so we had we had an old time band on the bluegrass band. We went to Ireland and Scotland. And, and here's a tune I learned while I was over. It's called Patty on the Turnpike.
<laughs> it's hard on old man. I wanted to mention some of the uh, folks along the way here tonight that's been big influences on me in, in the music. And uh, uh, one of my first, well, the professional musicians that that, uh, that really influenced me was Ralph Stanley. It was Carter, uh, Carter and Ralph Stanley, the Stanley Brothers. They're singing. Uh, you couldn't get any records up in Pocahontas County, any bluegrass records, and uh, except that... Uh, I forget the name of that little old store, but they had it. They called it a cutout bin. They'd be, uh, I don't know if I can even pronounce his name, Tchaikovsky or something. One that, and it, was, it was classical and a little bit of country, and, and every now and then you'd get a Stanley Brothers. There's nobody else much in there, but Stanley Brothers to have an album once in a while. And boy, they, they had that good old Baptist-style harmony singing and, and Ralph picking that banjo. So he was one of my biggest influences in I, I saw him several times. I got to play on stage with him, too. And I, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But uh, we went down to Galax one time to the Ruerton Club down there to see a show where he played. And he, he'd fell out of the back of a truck and uh, broke his leg. And I called down there, and I said, is Ralph going to be there? And they said, yeah. He said he'd be here. He's going to have to play in a wheelchair, but he'll be here. So, okay, we're coming in. And... So we went down. There was a whole, there was a bunch of us. There probably fifteen of us went down from up in this area and went down. There and they, they come down over the hill in a jeep wagoneer and got the wheelchair out and rolled Ralph up on the stage. And he played. And man, I, I loved it. It was really good. And he came. They rolled him back down. And I don't know whether anybody here knows who George Shuffler was or not, but George Shuffler was the first one that ever did the cross picking on the guitar on the flat top guitar. And he played with the Stanleys. They'd done a, they'd done a show a lot of times, just the three of them. It'd be Ralph and Carter and George Shuffler, either playing the bass or the second guitar. And he, he's the one that started that cross picking on the guitar. And me and him were standing there talking, and, and the guy that uh, had Ralph's wheelchair, Ralph got in the Jeep wagon there, and he went up the hill, and we was all there talking. And that guy said, well, I, I got to go. I got to get Ralph's wheelchair back up there. So we're getting ready to go, and... I said, you going up the hill now? And he said, yeah. I said, well, I'll just hop in right up with you then. So I jumped in Ralph's wheelchair. and He pushed me about 10 feet. And he said, get the hell out of here. <laughs> so I got to ride in Ralph Stanley's wheelchair. It's the point is, the point is whole story. But anyway, here's one of Ralph's tunes right here. And another thing. That uh, old brother, where art thou thing? You know, Ralph Stanley and Carter Stanley recorded that, I know, four times before that movie ever came out. Everybody think Dan Tominski did, was one, did that, but, uh, but Ralph and Carter did that at least four times in different keys even before that movie came out. And I just wanted to pass that on. Here's one called Hard Times.
called Hard Times. If you ever want to ask for that when I'm playing again, it'll be number four. <laughs> I knock my teeth out here. My biggest influence growing up and I learned to play music was my Uncle Dude. He was uh, my mom's brother. There was nine kids on mom's side of the family and seven out of the nine of them played music. And uh, there was two girls and seven boys and uh, one boy didn't play and one girl didn't play, which was my mom, but she was a great singer. Um, but Uncle Dude, had uh, he developed polio, was in a wheelchair. Um, and I can't pronounce this word right either, but Matty, there's hydrocephalic, whatever it is. But he had a he had a big head and a hump on his back and was in a wheelchair. And but he taught himself how to play. Started off the harmonica and he played all the instruments. He could play anything with strings. He played the fiddle. His main instrument was mandolin and guitar. Uh, he could play Merle Travis, Chet Atkins style, and uh, and he played the banjo, two finger style and claw hammer style. And uh, smoked pale mail cigarettes, <laughs> and ate salt rice bread, and drank coffee any time he was awake, you know. And he was my best friend, you know. And I, uh, when I got big enough, I could carry him around. I even before I had a license, I'd get him out and get him in the old truck and take him to the beer joints and carry him in and set him on a chair, and he'd sit in there and play music and for tips, you know. And uh, but he was a he was really funny. He had a great sense of humor and. But it was a, an amazing musician. But he but he taught all of us how to play. And he could play uh, this tune here. It's called Limehouse Blues. It's an old 30s tune. And he could play it with two fingers, but he knew all the chords on it. So he taught me this before he died. He died in 1974. And he played on our first our first recording we did was in, uh, let's see, it was in ni January 1971. He played mandolin on it, but then he died in 74. But here's one he taught me how to play, and um, I'd like for him, maybe he can still hear me play it, I don't know, with the with, with three-finger style, I call it. Here's the way he played, Limehouse Blues.
Anybody heard that tune before? I know some of you have. Yeah, I used to play it a lot, but I've kind of I've been playing it much lately, but it's a good tune. Let's see. I'm not going to ask for requests because I don't think y'all would ask for wagon wheel or nothing like that anyway, would you? Now, we might try that after a while. I'll do one here that, uh, this was one of my mom's most favorite tunes. She knew all the words to this, and I'd, I've got the words to it, but I don't know them. And, uh, it's, let's see. It's called The Old Spinning Wheel in the Parlor. Big influences up there in Pocahontas County was uh, Hamp Carpenter was one of them. Who was I know some of y'all remember Harley. Who he and, he and I and, and my uncle Dude I was talking about it. My brother Bill was the first members of the Black Mountain Bluegrass Boys, and uh, of course they're all gone now. But Hamp was Harley's dad, and, and uh, Hamp played claw hammer banjo and could dance and play the fiddle and and uh, blow dimes out of his nose and pull them out of his ears. And he was, he was a real character, you know, but he, and uh, he, uh, he ended up in somewhere outside of Atlanta in prison for making moonshine back in those days. And one of his best buddies, whose name was uh, Johnny Cobb, and Johnny ended up in prison too. And I'm not sure what he ended up being, but he was, he was just a good friend of mine. And, 
because he hung around up there at Hamps, you know. And they uh, taught me to eat dill pickle sandwiches and turtle and all kinds of stuff. But <laughs> but I got Johnny Cobb's songbook that he uh, put together while he was in prison, and it's a, a three binder notebook, and it's different people in there wrote the words, mostly old country songs. They'd write them down, and then they'd put their name under there and their their uh, number, their prison number was on the back of their uniform or whatever they call it, you know. It's a really cool book, you know, and I'm, I'm really glad I got it. But but Johnny Cobb taught me the worst of this song right here. It's called uh, Reuben, and you all heard Reuben, probably a lot of you had, but Johnny said that uh, it was written by a guy in, uh, over in Nicholas County around Richwood, over at Curtin, and uh, his name was uh, Reuben Yader, and his girlfriend's name was Realty Stonicker. I said, I don't know who anybody would name a girl realty, but unless it was a real estate person. Anyway, it goes like this right here. Train blown.
getting bored, are you? Let's see. Scruggs was one of my biggest influences. I, um, you know, Earl and Lester uh, started out, they came to work with Bill Monroe about two weeks from each other and ended up uh, having the, the really, really good the first bluegrass sound um, with Bill Monroe and uh, Chubby Wise on the fiddle. And they stayed with, with Bill and done some of the really, really good stuff in the late 40s and then they, they decided they wanted to quit and um, I could tell a lot of stories about Bill but he's the father of bluegrass music and I got to play with him too some and I, um, I, I loved him and I still love him a bunch but uh, they they broke up with him and started their own band and uh, they played for up into the late 60s about the time I got to play and then they broke up and uh, Earl went off with his son started playing a more modern kind of bluegrass music and then we played a few festivals together and at the same time I wouldn't go see him because and I'd never seen him before I wouldn't go see him because he's playing that modern bluegrass stuff <laughs> and uh, I finally I finally ran into him down at Nashville at the Spigma Awards back in the middle 90s somewhere and he was in a room sitting in there signing autographs and I went in and sit down and talk to him a few minutes and told him and I I told him that story, you know, and he he said he talked to me while give me his autograph on a big poster. I got it framed up at Mill Point on the wall. But but anyway, he was he was a, anybody that's a really good banjo player, Earl Scruggs was one of their biggest influences. And here's one of his tunes. If I don't mess this up, it might go out of tune. But uh, I'm gonna try it anyway. It's called the Flint Hill Special.
job. Good job. Oh, you're doing good. Let's see, you want to do uh, Rain and Snow, and then we'll go back and do Dixie Break Dance. Uh, another one of my big influences was Del McCurry. I know so most of y'all know who Del McCurry is. Well, uh, a friend of mine fixed up this, uh, the old schoolhouse dinner in Caldwell back in the uh, middle 70s sometime. And uh, he was having bluegrass bands in there. We played there and lost and found and the Peak Brothers and a few bands. And he said, Hefner, who could I get? And I said, I'll see if I can get a hold of Del McCurry. He lives up in Pennsylvania. He, that was back then, you know. And uh, he got Del McCurry to come and play down here at Caldwell for two nights for $800. You know, and I was living in uh, Fayette County at the time, and I came over here on Friday night, and uh, one of the biggest highlights of my life was that night. We uh, we sat in uh, in that bar after everybody else left, and we played all night till the next morning. Herschel Sizemore, who was one of the, if anybody knows mandolin players, he's one of the best mandolin players that ever played, and he was there, and uh, and Dale played the banjo, and I played the guitar, and we swapped back and forth. He had a flat tire on his bus. He just bought it, and uh, I drove all the way back to Nallon in Fayette County and where I worked for a trucking company, and I got tire tools and uh, jacks and came back over here from Fayette County and took that tire off that bus and took it over to into Lewisburg for where the Goodyear, I was Goodyear, what was the name? Anyway, it was in there where the, across from the courthouse now, Appalachian Tire was in there and got that tire fixed and uh, and Dell took us all over to the court restaurant and bought breakfast for us all. So that all happened here in Lewisburg. <laughs> so dell has been a, a friend of mine and when they played in town, he came, they all came down to the sweet shop. I know some of y'all, Bill and Gloria was probably there. They came in and uh, and uh, all everybody in the band played and they finally, I don't know, Two o'clock in the morning, they finally said, "You all got to get out of here." We went out on the sidewalk and played out on the sidewalk in front of the. It was the hobnobbery then, I think, and before it changed back. But anyway, this is one of Dale's tunes right here, and uh, if I don't fail, it's a Ola Bell Reed song. I think Ola Bell Reed wrote this. It's called uh, "Rain and Snow." Me, 
give me trouble all my life Left me out in the cold rain and snow Rain and snow Let me out in the cold rain and snow What the devil? Thank you. I'll put my capo de astro on here. That's what they used to call these things when you get them up at C.J. Richardson. There was a, I guess it was made in Mexico. They was called the capo de astro. I used I used a pencil and rubber band. Uh, Don Reno was one of my biggest influences. I, he used to play on WDBJ over on Channel 7 in Roanoke for years and years. Played the Virginia uh, Old Dominion Barn Dance in Rona, or in uh, Richmond. They'd ride from Roanoke down to Richmond and then they'd ride from Richmond back up to Harrisonburg and play up there. They were on the road all the time. They wrote a lot of these good tunes that, that uh, Reno and Smiley did while they was riding around in that car. This is one of them. Here's... This is called the Dixie Breakdown. Joanna doing a pretty good job keeping up there. <laughs> she does a great job. I'm so tickled. You know, it, it, uh, she probably pretty much saved me from uh, about retiring from playing here a couple, three years ago. I was about ready to quit. and uh, I just had, had it with some of the guys I was playing music with. And, uh, and then the COVID thing hit. And, but uh, she's really helped me out a lot, and I really appreciate it. Love you. <laughs> Yeah, okay, let's see. All right, another big influence of mine. I had a bunch of them, I guess. Uh, it was this guy was raised up down in Raleigh County. His name was Don Stover, and I, I know some of you have heard of him. He was raised up in a little town called Artie in Raleigh County, and he went to work for uh, 
he played with the Lilly Brothers for years and years, and he, he played with Bill Monroe in the uh, mid-50s. He recorded some really good stuff with Monroe in 57, sitting on top of the world, and some of these real good tunes. <laughs> Here's one that Don wrote, it's called uh, Black Diamond. That's a good tune right there. Yes, Don Stover was hard to beat. He, uh, I played bass with him a little bit. After he moved back to West Virginia, he went to Boston with the Lilly Brothers, and they played up there in Hillbilly Ranch seven nights a week. Played in behind chicken wire because they was throwing beer bottles and fighting and stuff all the time. And uh, I met him the first time in. Uh, Pittsburgh. Me and Harley went up there for the United Mine Workers National Convention. They hired us to come up to play with a country band for uh, one night. And um, they, they said they'd put us up in the Hilton. That's where the, this convention was held. And Arnold Miller was there and the Kennedys and a bunch of them. And we, went, we were there with uh, Dave and John Morse and some, a country band from uh, Charleston. Me and Harley rode up there in the car. The rest of them all went up on the bus. And we got up there and we met out back and we had to go in through the kitchen and walked in and went out and came out into this big ballroom. And I mean, it looked like a football field, you know, and all these people sitting around these tables. And right where we walked in, there was a big table there that had seating for 12, had lemon pie and a salad sitting there. And, you know, two forks and three spoons and all that stuff. And, crystal glasses and and uh, we looked around and so I said well yeah, let's sit down so we we sat down you know and we sat a little bit and this woman came in and said are y'all supposed to eat and I said yeah we're we're playing music and so oh, well, let me go check and see so she she came back in about five minutes and said no you all aren't supposed to eat and uh, I said well this table's empty and she said I know but uh, it's for somebody else or something y'all aren't supposed to eat I said okay so she left, and I said, "I got I'm eating my pie, and <laughs> and my salad, and and everybody else did too." And about the time we got done, she came back and said, "No, they said it was okay. You, you all go ahead and eat after we done eat her pie and salad." Then, but Don Stover was there. That uh, he come in. He was he was still up, and uh, he had his own band called the White Oak Mountain Boys, and uh, I got to meet him up there. And he was a 
just an incredible person, an incredible uh, banjo player. And he, he ended up getting uh, a brain tumor, and he, he moved back to West Virginia. He lost, he lost his, uh, this temple here sunk in, and he lost his sight in his eye, and it sunk shut. But anyway, I got to play bass with him some, and it was a real, real honor for me to get to do that. But I didn't mean to get carried away, but, but I love Don Stover. He was a great guy. What are we doing here? Oh, Blue and Lonely. Here's one I, this one I wrote back in uh, 1968. I used to have a joke about that, but I don't tell it anymore. Because it was actually 69. <laughs> well, the, it's not really a joke, but usually when I say 69, all the couples get up and leave the room. It goes a little bit something like this. It's called Blue and Lonely. that up out of my own head right there. Had enough wood left to make a small chopping block out of. Just for kindling. Let's see here. You can get be. Much well. Oh, get the old capo out here again. What time? I don't know. It's not late till two and it's too late. What is it? Thought somebody said something here. Oh, uh, here's a here's a JD Crow. He's one of my uh, big influences. This is one of his tunes that actually he and uh, Jimmy Martin, who was the king of bluegrass. This one they did here. It's called the Blackjack.
another influence of mine was a guy called uh, Alan Shelton. He played for years and years with um, Jim and Jesse, and he was uh, he was just a real different three finger style banjo picker. He played different stuff. And here's one that he played it's called that. He wrote this called the Banjo Bounce. We, you know, played all the time in a band thing. You don't get to play tunes like that that people can hear. You know, you just play, play band songs. It's what I've always done all my life, and what and what I really wanted to do. But I, I really appreciate getting to sit down and hear with you all and playing some tunes and Joanna helping out here do this. Some tunes that I really like that aren't old, you know, rolling in my sweet baby's arms and Rocky Top and that stuff. You know. Let's see. But that was waiting for sunrise. We play that. Yeah. What was the other one we played to see? Lime out. That was another. One. Well, we were going to. We did them all. Smiling, but, yeah. We did we not do it? We didn't do it. Oh, how much time we got left? I'm just curious. Whatever takes. Ten. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> huh? About three more. Okay. Okay, here's another one I wrote. Joanne always likes to do this in here. <laughs> you got to play your own songs, right? Well, if you ever turn on the AM radio station up in Pocahontas County, this is a song that they've been coming on the air with for 30-some years, I guess, every morning. I wrote this one in 1968, not nine. <laughs> it's called Me and Lonely Days.
somebody wanted to hear it and I, I, I got this little story about it most of you have already heard it but I know Josh has heard it a hundred times but <laughs> it's uh, my two grandmothers my grandmother Hefner um, she never played nobody on my dad's side of the family immediate family played music but but my grandma Odie she was a one of my big influences in other ways she pegged my pants back in the 50s when the you know, the peg pants, she'd sew them up on that Singer sewing machine and tighten my legs up on my britches for me and stuff so I'd look cool. And uh, she, uh, she she drank Virginia Gentleman, and she she drank three shots a day. She drank a shot in the morning, one at noon, and one before she went to bed and kept it under the sink all the time. And, and she did that until she was up in her 90s, and the doctor finally told her she's going to have to quit doing it. And, and and she finally drank herself to death at 103. <laughs> Great lady, Oda, Oda Christel Hefner, donated her body to science. They took her to, took, her to, took her to Charlottesville when she died, and that's the last we ever seen of her. My grandma, um, my grandma Irvin, who was my mom's mother, she died in uh, 1953. She was a banjo picker. And my grandpa was a fiddle player. And my grandma also was, uh, she was a running back for the Cleveland Browns. She was a tough woman. <laughs> she won the first tough woman contest in West Virginia in 1938. She got traded later on from Cleveland to Dallas, where she actually soon became a Dallas cheerleader. But here's one she played on the banjo, and I'm going to play it near the way she did, and she taught me how as I can. It goes like, like, a little like this right here. Find me there. 
Thank you. I had to cut that a little bit short there. I'll get short of wind. Well, thank you all so much for coming tonight. I, I, I love all of you, some of you way more than others. <laughs> Do this whole show for my wife there, Maddie. Hold your hand up, sweetheart. Wasn't for her, I couldn't do all this foolishness. She, she takes care of me, and, and I really appreciate and love her a bunch. We're going to finish up with a little bit of uh, When You're Smiling.